Welcome to the Appliance Educator Podcast, presented by Z-Line Kitchen and Bath, attainable luxury designed in Lake Tahoe. On today's episode of the podcast, we're joined by one of the biggest voices in the home improvement industry. Tom from The Money Pit is on the podcast. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Appliance Educator Podcast. As usual, it's your host, Drew, and I'm joined by my partner, Nick. Nick, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really stoked to be here today with you, Drew. Yeah, this is going to be an awesome episode. And today we are joined uh, by Tom from The Money Pit. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, guys. Good to see you. Happy to yeah. be here. And without further ado, Tom, uh, just let the whole audience know, what's The Money Pit? Well, The Money Pit is a nationally syndicated home improvement radio show. It's a podcast. It's a website. It's really a multimedia uh, company that focuses on home improvement. You know, we, we kind of have that niche where it's like the care and feeding of your home. You know, it occurred to me a long time ago that, you know, when you buy a toaster, you get a manual, right? <laughs> or at least today you get an app, but you get something. But when you buy a house, you're completely on your own, right? And so what we do is try to fill in that gap and try to bridge it you know, between you living and enjoying that house and you maintaining that house, you know, there's a lot to know. And it's also a situation where you can be taken advantage of by contractors and others that, you know, know that you don't know things and you can get led in different directions. So we kind of cover all of that. Um, our show was started, uh, I guess it's about 22 years ago now on one station in New Jersey, a little tiny station in the middle of the state. And now we have about 385 stations that carry us across the country every weekend. And uh, we do two hours uh, on those stations. And then we also do a podcast. And so the podcast is, is also carried, uh, you know, two episodes a week. We drop those on Mondays and Thursdays. We get a lot of folks that reach out to us through both vehicles uh, just to ask us questions because it's hard to get an impartial expert uh, answer from anybody these days. And we just try to do our best and serve that audience and just help them uh, become more successful in houses. Now, did you start this because you saw a need for it in your own life or in someone else's life? Well, completely by accident. You know, I have kind of a weird upbringing in the sense that I went to college to be a teacher and I was going to teach shop. And I loved working with my hands. I loved drafting. I loved, uh, you know, doing mechanical work, working on cars and so on. So I thought I love to teach. So that would be a good career for me. It was for a very short period of time, though, because Teachers just weren't making much money back then. It really wasn't a living you could sustain yourself on. So from there, I went into uh, contracting because the funny thing happened, you know, I'm, I'm there in the school and I'm, I'm doing my classes and I'm doing everything I should be doing. But at lunchtime in the teacher's room, right, where everybody gets together and, you know, talks, I used to get these teachers that would come up to me and say, hey, I hear you're pretty handy. Can you do a deck for me? Can you put a window on? And sooner or later, I was in the construction business and I had no intention of going there. It just happened. But, you know, that wears on you because I'm, you know, teaching until two or three. And then even with long summer days, by the time I get home and eat, it was eight o'clock and then the whole thing would repeat the next day. So I actually left teaching, went into construction. And then uh, when I got tired of that several years later, I went into home inspection because that was the opportunity for me to not only uh, teach, right? Because now you have one one on one clients. Uh, they're buying a house. They know very little for the most part. And they need somebody to give it a good review and tell them, you know, what they're looking at in terms of uh, expenses now and in the, and in the future. Uh, and so that kind of enabled me to combine those skills. And in order to promote that, promote that home inspection business, that's where radio first came in. Because I thought, hey, why don't I just do this on the radio? And I used to get asked to go on shows once in a while and be like, you know, the expert for the show. And people would call in and ask why their toilet leaks or their floors are squeaking. And I would just, you know, answer those questions. So I thought, I think there's a show in here. It turned out it didn't do much for my home inspection business. <laughs> it was just too specialized, you know, and it wasn't drawn in. It got a lot of questions, but those people weren't buying houses. But I, I enjoyed it. And so that's how it grew from there. I, I got syndicated at one point. I started doing a lot of TV appearances as a guest on, you know, network television and local television shows. I think I, think I did over 2,000 TV, uh, TV appearances in my career, uh, if you count all of the local ones I've done across the country. Uh, and, you know, people just have a need for this information. And so it ended up forming around me and I had to accept it. <laughs> I didn't say, hey, I want to be a home improvement you know, expert on, uh, in media when I grow up. But that's just kind of how it happened. And so I think, you know, as we get older, that happens for a lot of folks. What you think you want to be, you know, when you're younger and what you plan to be morphs and changes. And you just wait for those planets to align and you 
you make those decisions and and sometimes we end up in a place different than when we expected absolutely i thought i was going to make surf videos my whole life coming out of high school <laughs> <laughs> now i'm doing a client yeah. video yeah you're out here in the desert now. <laughs> you know yeah, I, that's close right <laughs> i think that's so interesting though to kind of see you know you let us inside of like where you started and how you know your passion mm -hmm. for teaching and also your pa passion for you know being a craftsman did yeah. manifest itself where you are just not the path you plan to take originally yeah. uh, just from curiosity, I mean, from the early feedback, did you say, hey, I, I get such good interaction, I'm going to make a pitch for this concept with the content? Or were you kind of approached based on your presence early on? I'd just be curious to kind of know like the inroad from going into doing a little spot on the on the radio station to like a full fledged content brand. Uh, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, so here's like the dark side, right? I, I felt like you did. I thought, hey, this is a great idea. The stations will jump at this. I said to the stations, local stations, you guys can make money. You know, every heating and cooling contractor or a carpenter or a window guy, you know, they would love to support a show like this. And they're like, yeah, kid, why? So it, it ended up after in total frustration. I said, okay, how much would you charge me to buy an hour of radio time? I get all the commercials and you guys do nothing, but I pay you for it. Like, what's that worth? So they gave me a number and I thought, okay, I'll take it. So I basically bought time before today. Today it's called broker time and it's, kind, it's very common. Back then, it was completely unheard of. And so I bought the time. I said, all right, I got to sell. It was $250 an hour. I said, okay, I got to sell five sponsors. I sold like eight at like 100 bucks a piece or something. So I was making money right from the get-go. And I'm like, see, <laughs> I told you. Ah. And so that's how it started. I, I didn't wait to be discovered. I self-discovered and self-initiated the whole time. You know, if you stand around and wait for somebody to, you know, to be your sort of guardian angel, you know, that may never happen. Uh, for me, I just had an idea and I thought, uh, you know, it was an opportunity. Now, mind you, I didn't hang up my home inspection shingles day one and go right into, into radio. I just developed it over time to the point where it was self-sustaining. And then I made the move completely out of that inspection career, but yet taking that knowledge with me. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask us, uh, and I, by the way, I should mention that I have a co-host, a terrific co-host. We've been together for many, many years, Leslie Segretti. She uh, was made famous in while you're out trading spaces and a lot of those early home improvement decor shows that you see on the Wii network and HDTV and so on. And presently, uh, she still works with me on the show, but she's also the uh, art director for Good Morning America. So uh, together, you know, we have a lot of knowledge and it always surprises us that people say, hey, how do you get your answers to the questions? Do you have somebody looking those up for you? Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's a concierge service, you know? Yeah. No, um, we just do this stuff. And after doing uh, six or 7,000 home inspections, if I know how old your house is, I have in my head a set of, the, a set of conditions in terms of the way it was built uh, and what sort of goes wrong with houses of different generations. And I have enough knowledge to kind of narrow it down. And the thing is, to most people that own homes and even people that rent, rent apartments, their problems are so unique, right? They've never seen it before. Uh, it's full of uh, a lot of anxiety and, and concern and worry. For us, houses break down the same way all across the country. They really do. And yes, you've got unique soil conditions and you've got unique weather patterns, but you know they wear and they tear pretty much the same way. And so we've seen uh, a lot of these things that people call us about time and time again. How did you and Leslie connect? Uh, I was looking for a co-host. Um, I put an ad in a trade publication. I got, um, I remember my office manager uh, said, we're getting a lot of tapes. And I wasn't home at the time. I think I was at a builder show or something. I come back. She had found two laundry baskets and she had filled those up with all the pouches. <laughs> People that were applying for the job. And Leslie was one of them. And when I saw the tape and I, and I saw her personality, I just thought, you know, I felt like, hey, she's like my kid sister that I never had. You know, it's like that kind of a thing in terms of her knowledge of the, of the industry. She's like uh, the yin and the yang of what I do. And I thought it would be a great combination. She was strong on design, strong on decor. Her dad was a landscape, I mean, an interior spaces architect. Um, and so it just was a good fit. And um, we've enjoyed working together. That's awesome. Um, where my mind wanders next before Nick's got some good things <laughs> we're going to dive into today. But I guess my, my mm -hmm. first question, first time homeowner. Yeah. What would be the biggest piece of advice you would give the first time homeowner who's like, look, it's mine now. I need to fix it mm -hmm. up. I, it's mine. I have to deal with it. And like you said, it doesn't come with yeah. a manual. What would be I know, yeah. Well, the first thing I would tell you before you, if you're going to buy a house and I don't care if it's your first time or your 10th time, 
you absolutely positively need to get a home inspection. And not only a home inspection, but a good home inspection, because there's a wide range of quality that's out there. And so I would send you to the website for the American Society of Home Inspectors. They're the, uh, an, an authority that tests and certifies these members. And it's not just like fill out this form and you're in. You know, you have to have experience and prove it. So you get a good home inspection and you go there and you let that inspector be your, your teacher for that house. You're going to learn very quickly what the strengths and weaknesses are. And not only will, you, will that inspector hopefully identify you know, any major flaws that exist then, you know, he can give you advice like, okay, your roof's 10 years old. It looks okay now. Normally with this type of roof, this exposure, you don't have a lot of trees. You're looking at 15 to 20 years. Here's what you look for to know if it needs to be you know, fixed. If you get a leak, it doesn't mean you need a new roof. And they're kind of going on and on and teaching you about the house as they go. So get the inspection is my first piece of advice. Um, and the second one would be just to understand uh, in terms of your improvements. Sometimes we think everything gets, gives you a return on investment. Not true. Uh, some improvements give you a better return on investment. Suffice to say, a decked out man cave does not. Yet, maybe you want to build one because you enjoy it. And that's okay. Just don't, you know, say, honey, I'm going to build a man cave. I think it'll be a great investment. I'm going to double <laughs> my you're gonna, that's, man cave. I don't think you're going to get it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I am in the process of doing that. I got the okay, but uh, I yeah. do it for you. I'm that's, doing it for me. It. There you go. There you go. Uh, so I would say, uh, make sure that you understand the improvements that you're going to make. Um, uh, some are going to have a, a good ROI and some aren't. Um, I would think that you should be making decisions based on how long you envision being in that house because some improvements you want to make and some repairs you want to do one way or the other based on that number. I'll give you a good example. Um, if you need a roof and let's say that you have um, one layer of roofing there and the roof's failed and now you have to put another roof on, you have a decision as to whether or not you want to take that old roof off, which is the right way to do it, or you just want to put a second layer on, which is okay, cheaper way to do it, but it's not going to last as long because that first roof layer holds a lot of heat. That heat dries out the asphalt and the shingles and it causes it to fail more quickly. So how does that apply to this conversation is that if you are going to be in that house for five years, who cares? <laughs> See ya. Sorry. The roof was going to last 20. Now it's going to last 10, but it's not, I'm, I'm out of here. But if you're like, hey, I'm going to be here for, for you know, at least the whole life of this roof, then I'm going to take that layer off. So you're going to make those kinds of decisions based on how long you're going to be in the house. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, make sure that you pay attention to seasonal maintenance. And by seasonal maintenance, for example, heating and cooling system maintenance. Just because you turn the furnace on because it got cold this month and it works doesn't mean it's okay. Because... If you have natural gas or you have uh, oil or you have propane, any fossil fuel, those, those burners uh, build up dirt. They build up combustion deposits as you use them. And that has to be cleaned off um, because if not, um, the system not only works at, at the least it will happen, it will work inefficiently. Worst case scenario, it won't burn fully. And if it doesn't burn fully, guess what? It starts to generate a high level of carbon monoxide, which is dangerous. Now, even though that carbon monoxide should be venting through the system and out, if you happen to get a, another failure, like a crack in the heat exchanger or a blocked chimney or something like that, it makes it extremely dangerous. So make sure that your heating system is serviced, your air conditioning system is serviced, both for energy efficiency and for uh, safety. Um, when it comes to hiring uh, contractors, remember that contractor is going to try to sell you what they think the right repair is or what they would like you to buy. It's always better to do your research ahead of time. And certainly we have more ways to do that today than ever before. So if you decided, for example, you wanted to um, renovate, uh, let's just say something small. Let's say we're doing a hall bathroom, not a big project, just a hall bathroom. So you might say, uh, do your research and say, okay, I want American standard faucets or, or I want a, a Kohler a sink or, or a specific toilet, certain type of shower doors. You do all that research ahead of time, right? because it's better for you to have a specification or a list of what your expectations are for contractors to bid on than for you to you know, call somebody that's like, you know, 1-800-I-do-baths or whatever. You know, I just made that up. I don't know if that's a real number. Uh, and the guy comes in and just sells you a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, you need to do the research. And this way also, if you have those specifications, you go to two or three contractors. That's assuming you've checked them out. They all have good references, but you know that they're bidding apples to apples, right? So they're not bidding... Uh, different projects. And this way you can fairly compare their prices as well. So that's really a, an important thing to do when you're doing these renovations is to do your, your research ahead of time. Yeah. And like you said, there's so many options for you to find this 
information at, what are some go-to yeah. places for you? Where would you start uh, for research on something like a, a hall bathroom? Well, I mean, I, I probably at this point wouldn't have to do a whole lot of research, but the areas that I would be thinking about would be, let's say plumbing fixtures and faucets. So I'm gonna be looking for, uh, for fixtures and faucets that are labeled water sense. Now you're probably familiar with the term energy star, right? We see that all over the place on efficient TVs and refrigerators and whatever. Well, yeah. water sense is the plumbing equivalent of that. Also a department of energy program. And it certifies that the fixture of the faucet is water efficient. And so I would be looking at water sense uh, in terms of the products that I buy. And I would also next be thinking about, um, you know, surfaces, right? So, so flooring, for example, you have so many options today. It used to be that, you know, the only way to do a floor was tile, but there's a lot of ways to do floors today that are completely waterproof. I just uh, worked with a product that's brand new from LL Flooring called Duravana. And this stuff's amazing. You can throw it in a pool. It has no effect on it. It's completely waterproof. And when you lock the seams together, because it's a plank, when you lock them together, the seam is waterproof. So that means if the tub overflows, it'll be, it'll be, you know, it'll be a little sloppy, but the water won't go through the floor to the subfloor. So that's a floor that's four bucks a square foot. You know, if you're going to do tile, you're going to probably spend 10, 12 or more easy if, you, if you're going to do, you know, a mud base and, and everything else and multiple trips from the contractor. So you have a lot of options on flooring. So I would consider materials in a bathroom. I'd also pay really careful attention to ventilation. We get so many calls from people that are upset by moldy caulk or moldy walls. And it's usually because it's not vented right or vented enough. There's a really weird building code that says, if you have a window, you're not required to put in an exhaust fan. Let's think about this, okay? Summer, okay. Fall, a little cold. January, most parts of the country, you gonna leave your window open while you're taking a shower? I don't think so. So um, no matter whether you have windows or not, whether you have a fan now or not, you need to put one in. It's gotta be a good one, and which means it's gotta move a lot of air and it should be hooked up to a humidistat. That's a uh, switch, like a light switch, except what it's doing is it's sensing humidity. And so you set the humidistat to come on automatically when the steam starts to build, the fan will kick on and you, know, you shut the shower off, you dry out and you get out of there. But guess what? The bathroom's still full of steam. It keeps running until that steam's gone and then it goes off. So little things like that, I think um, today are, are really important when you're doing those spaces. And that's one where you do get a good return on best investment. You're going to sell the house you know, your real estate agent or your potential buyer is going to ask you when it was last renovated. Um, and, and also, lastly, speaking of that, make sure you get a permit when you're supposed to get a permit, <laughs> because when you go to sell your house, they're going to check the building permit file. And if it's not there, it's going to be a problem and it's going to be a mess to get out of. So, you know, do it right. Those guys are there to help you. They're not there to hurt you or charge you money, make you pay fees. Those inspectors are there to look for uh, issues that could affect your health and safety. Yeah. Hey guys, Drew from the Appliance Educator Podcast here, and I just wanted to take a minute out to talk about our amazing sponsor, Z-Line Kitchen and Bath. You've heard the guests and the hosts talk about this amazing brand and all the attainable luxury that they create right here in the heart of Lake Tahoe, USA. From freestanding ranges to ventilation, dishwasher and microwave, to everything you'll need to complete your next bathroom project, Z-Line Kitchen and Bath is bringing luxury into your next project. On, on the topic of that uh, fan that you were speaking of, that kind of technology yeah. where it senses the steam, is there any other new tech that you've kind of come across recently that you're really pumped on and you think it will really help and see in every home from here on out? Well, I think as homes get tighter, um, we, we know that we, they, need to be, they need to breathe more than they do, right? So an old house, just to kind of take you through it, my house was built in 1886. I'm sure back then it probably got like eight to 10 air changes per hour. That means all the air in the inside of the house would exchange with all the outside air year round, eight to 10 times an hour. So imagine that you have to heat all that air when you bring it into the house. So it becomes very expensive. So now we put in better windows and we have better siding and we have better weatherproofing and, and we keep bringing it down, bringing it down, bringing it down. So, you know, if I can get my house to two air changes per hour, that's, that's great for an old house. But, you know, you can have a brand new house that's built to an Energy Star standard because there are such things as Energy Star homes and they may have a half air change per hour. Well, at some point, the indoor air um, is no longer fresh, right? So there is a point where it's too tight and then you start getting more humidity on the walls from all the breathing and pets and everything else. 
So the solution here is technology that always measures um, the air in the house and, and basically opens and closes and lets air in and out. It's like an air to air heat exchanger. And it does that automatically without you thinking about it. So the technology to allow houses to always have the right amount of fresh air is very interesting to me. And it's something we've been waiting for for a long time. And I think we're starting to see it more and more now than ever before. That's great. And would that run through like your HVAC system in your home, most likely, or? Yes. Um, yes. It, and it does, it is a, you know, it, it's not the kind of thing that lends itself well to retrofit. It's something you're going to see more in new construction because you got to have the, the ducting system in place for it. Well, that's might be something interesting for mm -hmm. range hood companies to allow, you know, that's ducted out. Maybe that's a way to reverse that and duct in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it's all part of that's all part of the calculation, you know, when, when it comes to range to range hoods, you know, if you're going to, if you have a really strong range hood, like maybe you have a, you know, commercial uh, quality kitchen, you've got a really strong range hood. Well, um, the installers will know this, but you have to have what's called make up air because yeah. you can't depressurize the inside of your house. If you do that, bad things happen. Like instead of all of those fumes we were talking about with your heating system going up the chimney, they come back into your kitchen to find their way to that fan. So um, you have to have the right balance and it's all part of, of HVAC design. This is not new, uh, but it's just something to be aware of. You can't just do something, you know, every, every um, action is going to have a reaction and, you know, with ventilation in a house, you just have to be aware of it. Yeah. And as something I think we've seen, especially over the last few years across the country, so many different States and counties now have more stringent and specific regulations on makeup air and just HVAC in general and airflow in the home. Right. Yeah. So yep. I got a question for you and it's kind of, you, you shared a, a photo with me last week where um, a little rodent friend had <laughs> yeah. your uh, uh, yeah. dishwasher hose. And um, one, I want to know some tips for, you know, when the weather is getting warmer and these kinds of things can happen more frequently, what are some tips for that? And also I want to share a, a mouse story with you about our boss. Um, once yeah. you so yes, yeah, so I'll tell you what happened. So we had bought a new dishwasher. Uh, we got a Bosch dishwasher. I liked the brand. It was rated tops by Consumer Reports. It was not expensive. Uh, so I took out the old one, put this in, and you know, dishwasher installation when you're six foot two is not an easy thing because this body does not fit in the cabinets that well. <laughs> so I got it all done. I ran everything I had to run, and I was very happy with my installation. And, and a week later. I got this error code, I think it was E8. I'm like, what the heck is that? And you look it up and it's like, it's a leak. I'm like, no way. I mean, every connection I know is perfect. I watched them run a couple of times. Well, sure enough, I looked again and I felt under the dishwasher and it was wet. So I pulled it out and my eyes, I could not believe it. So we have an, an elbow, um, you know, where the, the drain line hooks up yeah. and yeah. the mice had chewed an inch and a half hole in this drain line. I had never seen anything like it before. I mean, you could stick your finger in it. It was so big. Wow. Uh, and so I'm like, wow, hey, guess what? I got great content for the radio show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good news, it wasn't the installation. Bad news, I got mice to deal with. So, all right, put it back together. I got a new drain hose, hooked it back up, put it in there, ran it again, E8. What? No way, I fixed it. How could it still be leaking? I looked again. Sure enough, there was another leak down there. So now I take the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. I turn it upside down. I get my old home inspector flashlight on and I start really looking inside that. And sure enough, there was a rubber, um, I'll call it a bushing or, or a, a, a hose that was about an inch and a half long. And I think it was between the pump and another piece. And I looked at it. And sure enough, there were little teeth marks that had just clawed in there and broke through. And I had a second leak. So um, I got some, I took the old hose that I'd taken off. I made myself a, a patch out of that because it's the same material. Mm -hmm. And I used this stuff called Total Tech, which is made by the super glue company. And it's, a, it's an adhesive caulk that actually will harden underwater. And so I used that and a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of uh, band clamps, radiator clamps, and I fixed it back up, put it back together, watched it, all good. But so it was quite an adventure uh, in, in problems with mice. Now I have an old house and I get mice from time to time. I've never ever had mice do damage to an appliance like that. And so what I usually do, but I hadn't done yet is I find in our part of the country, the mice like to come in in fall and winter they're looking for a warm place. Mm -hmm. they, usually, they don't usually come in the summer because there's plenty of options to them then. So what I do is I use, um, I use different types of redenticide. I use a kind that's in a package like a little bag 
And for those, I will put them on the foundation, top of the foundation. I have three different crawl spaces the way my house is set up, which is typical of old houses that just seem to go on and on. And so I like that they're kind of flat because I do the frisbee with them and just throw them down in the crawl space, you know, hit the back wall, boom, they land right there where the mice love to, to travel. And then I'll also use bait stations. And this is important to know about because if you have pets, you have to be really careful yeah. with, uh, with mouse bait. So what a bait station is, is it's a plastic box that's completely sealed and the bait is inside and there are small holes for the mice to get in, but uh, the, pet, the pets can't get it. So with a combination of bait stations and the packets, uh, that's how we sort of set up the perimeter defense system uh, for the house. And, you know, they haven't, they haven't dared come back uh, yet. I feel like I'm like throwing out the challenge to them right now by saying that, but um, so far, so far it's been about a, a month or so and, and so far so good. Well, I have a great mouse story for you <clears throat> and everyone yeah. else. Our big corporate uh, boss here, uh, he has a really nice Porsche and he was like, I can't figure out what this smell is in this Porsche. And so I take a look and I'm going through the cabin filter. I lift it up and I'm like, there's dog food all in here. Like the whole cabin filter is full of dog food and mm -hmm. come to find out there's a huge mouse problem in, yep. the, in the car in the car. Yep. And yep. Yep. it was insane insane how yep. we, the we had to take it to yeah. an exterminator and a, a a specialty detailer to eradicate there was just dead mice in it because he does this isn't his everyday driver car this is something yeah that keeps him how did the dog how, did, did he did he transport a dog in the car is that why the food was there no the the mice were taking the dog's food from his house and stacking oh, it oh, into oh and they just used it they thought, hey, that's going to be a really nice condo for us. We'll set yeah, up a shop in the 911. It was a, it was a <laughs> mansion for these mice, we're, this mouse family. That... We're in the high desert here. So when it gets cold, it gets cold. And I, I had a girlfriend yeah. that I dated and her Kia, <laughs> exact same thing. It was just absolutely wrecked. She worked for the forest yeah. service. So I would drive her up. And when she would commute herself, you know, she'd be out, out in the forest all week. And so eventually she came mm -hmm. back. She's like, the car's just not running good. We take it in the mechanic. And the guy's just pulling yeah. all the hair out of like every orifice and yep. he's like you don't have an error code but like there are things chewing so what i realized was is oh you drive up the hill you park it the engine's warm you go out and commute and go into the forest and then mm -hmm. all the mice are like oh this is a nice warm little spot yeah you stay all week and when you start it up yeah. on friday they all come squirting out <laughs> and, mm -hmm. yeah well i have a friend who i have a friend who um you know takes her dog back and forth uh to the kennel and she had been leaving uh, when she does she brings the dog food with her and she had left some dog food in the car during one of these trips for over a weekend or something. And at the kennel, they noticed that, hey, you know, there's holes in these bags. She's like, what? Yeah, there are holes in the bags. Well, it turned out the mice found the dog food in the car. So the food was there, they stayed there, ate enough, then they went off in the car somewhere and died. Same thing, had to basically rip the car apart to try to get rid of the smell and, and, uh, and all of that stuff. So it's a heck of a mess when they get into vehicles. Oh yeah, we took the car to a specialty place to get it the ozone done and right he, he couldn't ozone it anymore because after so <laughs> long people deteriorate the leather yeah. inside right and it was it was a nightmare it was <laughs> insane how, how large of a mouse family was in that tiny little car right nick and i are both like new homeowners in the in, within the last year and i think this is a great question right. about um like because you you mentioned i think some of the best stuff to kind of circle back on like doing your research and really thinking about how am i going to stay in the home and that's kind of the value of the project you know it's not just simply mm -hmm. like hey everything's equity you got to kind of think about is this equity to me is this the product right. i want and do your homework but a, a great question nick kind of had lined up some of the easy kind of curb appeal upgrades especially i think when someone's getting ready to probably sell their home do you got any recommendations there on like kind of what are some of the best things to look for on those curb appeal upgrades yeah. So first of all, remember, um, landscaping is always the best thing to do when it comes to curb appeal, um, because, you know, it's inexpensive and it, and it has that good sort of, you know, drive by view. Uh, today, it used to be everything had to be set for the physical inspection where people would drive by or come with a realtor. So now remember, it's got to look good uh, in a camera. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you do good photography and and control the environment, right? So if you got a lot of clutter, get rid of it, do nice pictures, use wide angle lenses and such. Uh, that makes a really big difference if you wanna sell the house today. And that's an inexpensive, easy thing to do. The other things I would say is make sure you stay on top of your maintenance. So no peeling paint, 
you know, uh, I always hate that when I do the home inspection and <laughs> I will find a brand new filter inside a furnace that clearly hasn't had a lick of maintenance in a decade. <laughs> so that to me says, you know, these people are kind of trying to cheat on their maintenance. You can't really trust them. Here's a great example of it. Now my antenna are up, my spidey sense is up. Now I'm really looking for, for issues. So stay on top of your maintenance. It's a small investment and it really does, you know, it really does make a big difference uh, when it comes to, to selling that house. And the other thing is that when you get in the house, uh, and this is probably, if I give you one tip that would save you more money than anything else, it would be this. When you get in the house, typically you have a lot of energy and you want to change a lot of things. So I had a friend once that got into a new townhouse and he and his wife wanted to take down all the wallpaper, every room. I'm like, oh my God, I mean, wallpaper is a job and a half. You really are, you know, you don't want to do this all at once. I said, wait, 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 don't do it right away. Because when you wait, when you get in, one of two things is going to happen. Either the need and desire to make a change, whether it's painting or wallpapering or new flooring or whatever, a new kitchen, that, that need will continue to grow and grow strong and you'll end up doing the project. Or six months time, you'll find out, hey, this kitchen is not so bad and that wallpaper is growing on me. I'm not going to do it. And you just saved yourself a boatload of money. So give yourself time to adjust to the new space because you want to see it over time, over seasons. And then, you know, you'll end up working on the stuff that's most important to you and leaving the rest. I think that's a great that's, tip. That's great tips. I wish I would have done that three months ago. <laughs> yeah. <it's>, <laughs> three months <laughs> late, huh? <laughs> I don't think this guy has slept in the last six months just based on everything yeah. he's been doing with his home. Well, it's, I don't want to blame it on my girlfriend, but. <laughs> don't, don't, don't make that mistake. Yeah, I won't, I won't, I won't go anywhere yeah. with that one, but. But yeah, there was a lot of, we should do this. We should do that. We should do You came this. in with a list. Yeah. 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 You came yeah. in with day one. You had a list. Yep. It's natural. You know, it's natural. Yeah. You want to be able to make all those changes. And after a while, you say, why do we buy this house if we have to make so many changes? You know? <laughs> yeah. My approach was kind of like, I'm going to be here. At what Kind of like what you said, Tom, what, what I'm going to need to do will come out to me as I live here right. and I'll be able to yeah. do that one by one. No need to rush. Right. It's yep. easy because you know, it, it's just me. So I don't. <laughs> Yeah. I don't have the uh, second influence who came with a, a project yeah. for me on day one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But I love her. It's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're doing it. <laughs> well, and, she, and she's going to, and she's going to watch this video. Okay. So you better watch it. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, he's happy to do it too. Yep. Happy. Yep. Happy yep. as clam. <laughs> so Tom, uh, it's obvious to the audience. You're just an immense wealth of knowledge. I want to thank you for your time today. Where can everybody okay. get all the amazing money pit content? Yeah, so just go to moneypit.com. Uh, that's our website. And you can search for whatever you need there. Uh, and also, if you go to moneypit.com slash podcast, uh, you'll find a number of different ways that you could follow us on our podcast. It's a free podcast. Uh, we drop two episodes a week, uh, Mondays and Thursdays. And, uh, and also, you can call in your home improvement questions. We have a, uh, an interesting number. It's 888-MONEYPIT. So 888-666-3974. Uh, you can leave your question. We'll call you back next time we're in the studio. Um, or you can post your question online or just reach us through social media. So we love getting those questions. We're happy to answer them uh, on the show every week. Awesome. Well, we hope uh, we hope you see some uh, people from the Appliance Educator fandom uh, All right. <laughs> there for the Money Pit. And Tom, thanks again for your time today, man. It's been enlightening. Okay. And I encourage everyone to go check out the Money Pit content. If you thought Tom was sharp today, believe me, they just are loaded with great advice there. So thank you for your time today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Good luck, guys. Thanks, right. Tom. Take it easy. This has been the Appliance Educator Podcast, brought to you by Z-Line Kitchen and Bath. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow at Appliance Educator for more tips and tricks and advice to keep your home running at optimal performance. If you have any ideas or topics you'd like to hear on future episodes of the show, leave us a comment. Appliance Educator, signing off.